Hello, and now we go from the quantum web to the social web with Professor Yamir Moreno from the University of Saragossa. So we go from uh, physical atoms to social atoms, I guess. Um, thank you very much again for uh, these fellowships. It's an honor for me. Um, today um, I will be talking about the physics of humans because I think that um, the most complex of all these complex systems is, are those that involve human behavior. So I will be speaking about humans not as human beings but about how uh, we behave uh, we interact, organize, and give rise to collective behavior. Um, it is also about whether or not the methods of physics are suited to describe large-scale complex systems. And finally, it's also a personal view of uh, what we know and what we should do if we are not understanding this kind of large-scale social systems. Um, as you know, physics has been extremely successful in describing our natural world. But, um, and, and we, as a matter of fact, as a statistical physicist, we are used to deal with many particle systems. Um, the issue is then um, that this is the reason, perhaps, why we have started to look at problems that are not e normally considered to be the subject of traditional physics. Um, the issue is that in a large-scale social system, we have a lot of new challenges that we have to address. Um, I will start to argue today that um, the sort of problems that we face are not trivial at all, and that there are a lot of questions that we have to answer before we can um, let's say that we have a theory that describes human behavior and its associated collective behavior. So uh, there are several reasons why I'm asserting this. Uh, the first is that we don't know how human behave. Um, secondly, uh, humans are heterogeneous, they are not, uh, we cannot treat humans as ideal gases or, 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 or homogeneous systems. Uh, on the other hand, we, we know that the dynamics is also ruled by the way in which we interact with each other and also with the environment. And finally, because I hope to show that many methods of physics fails when it comes to describe um, and analyze human collective behavior. So let's elaborate a little bit uh, by giving, by providing three specific examples that I think will illustrate my points here. Uh, the first has to do with how humans interact with the environment and how we react to the inputs that we receive. Uh, in a very simple but uh, insightful experiment a few years ago, um, participants were asked to pay for the milk they consume with coffee or tea. Um, and the, the key issue is that they were given the freedom to pay or not to pay. The amount to be paid is fixed, but they can decide whether to pay or not. And then um, another important aspect of the experiment is that in front of tea and coffee dispensers, they were shown this kind of image with flowers or different faces. And, and then um, the conclusion of the experiment was that, okay, let's measure how much money we collect uh, in different weeks when, when we alternate between different pictures. And it turns out that the amount of money collected depends very much of what participants see. And this is quite interesting because this is showing how human reacts to the influence of the environment. As a physicist will say, this means that humans can be fine-tuned. So we, we can just move a little bit and, and get a little bit more of money. Uh, the second example concerns the law of human behavior. And to, to address these questions, I will refer to one problem that is a very relevant question, not only in physics, uh, but in, in 
science, and it's the problem of cooperation. Cooperation emerged in many different at all organizational levels in the animal kingdom, and obviously also in the in the in human society. As a matter of fact, we, we evolved from primitive society to our modern globalized world with nations and supranational institutions. And these kind of problems are usually dealt with using what we call social dilemmas. That essentially, we have two kinds of players, one which is cooperators that support um, other cooperators and, and the, the, the wealth of the community, and others that are called defectors. And the issue here is that dilemma exists because from a selfish viewpoint, the, from an individual viewpoint, the best is to defect. Unilateral defection is the best, provides the larger payoff while mutual cooperation is more um, b uh, beneficial for both players, as seen here. Meals can only eat if both cooperate, otherwise uh, they, they cannot eat. So the problem from a theoretical point of view is that we, we, we know that this, the cooperation exists, but uh, from a theoretical point of view, if you assume that we live in a well-mixed population, cooperation does not survive. So one solution that was proposed in the early 90s by May, um, um, Martin Novak was that population structure plays a role, that uh, population structures uh, foster the um, cooperation in social dilemmas. Um, however, in order for this to be true, we have to assume some simple rules about how humans behave when they are facing to these kind of situations. And in particular, that the reaction of humans follows or depends on the uh, payoff difference between our own benefits and those of our neighbors. The question is then, is that true? I think that in the best spirit of physics, there is only one left that we can do, is go back to the lab and do the experiment just to test the theoretical hypothesis. And this is what we did in December 2011. Um, we performed at that time the largest experiment today uh, with humans uh, playing a spatial prisoner dilemma. And these were more than 1,000 students uh, belonging to 42 uh, schools, high school uh, in Aragon, in Spain. And they were randomly arranged in two topologies. One is a square lattice in which you have that all individuals have the same connectivity. And the second one is heterogeneous networks in which, as we know, a few individuals are highly connected while others are not. And again, the conclusion of the experiments were quite illuminating. Um, there were two main conclusions. The first one is that the structure of the population does not affect the, low, the level of cooperation. You see here that actually they are roughly the same. And the second conclusion is that this happens because players' behavior does not depend on the payoff differences. So our models, our theoretical models, were not assuming uh, the right loads for the behavior of human, or how human behaves, you know. Uh, so we have to take this into account when we deal with humans. Finally, the last example has to do with human collective behavior and um, how uh, heterogeneities give rise to different kind of collective behavior. And this is a very simple model, and this is due to Granovetter, it's a threshold model. Um, let's suppose that we have a population of n individuals. Uh, each of which are, is characterized with a threshold. And then let's imagine that we have two uh, scenarios. In the first one, we have uh, one uh, individual with threshold zero. This is the first adopter or the initiator of whatever collective movement we have. Uh, then we have one with threshold one, another one with threshold two, and so on and so forth, up to the last individual that needs that everybody is active to activate himself. Uh, if you uh, suppose that this uh, initiator is active, then this will lead to a cascade of uh, activation, uh, and, if, and finally this will, will lead to a cascade of size n. All individuals will be part of the collective uh, action. But now let's suppose that we make just microscopic change. Let's suppose that we change the threshold of just one individual. And for example, let's suppose that now we don't have any individual with threshold one, but we, do, we have two individuals with threshold two. This means that once the initiator is active, there is nobody here, and then the cascade will be of size one, will be of the other extreme. Actually, we will not have any collective behavior. And this example, this very simple model shows that in this case, when we deal with human systems, details matter, and that the average individual approach, which is very common in physics, this mean field behavior, is often useless. We have to take into account many initial conditions or many possibilities for the initial conditions of the system. 
And this is important because as we have seen uh, recently, there are a lot of protests and social movement at a very large scale. So if we want to start a collective behavior of large scale system, we have to be, um, we have to know that the individual propensity to join a group uh, around a common goal or, or a collective action determines whether or not the, the, um, the collective phenomenon takes place at all. It could be, it could be or couldn't be. Uh, then on top of this, we have also the, the ICT revolution, and we have this kind of um, online social networks, this collective behavior that adds new ingredients that we have to also take into account. This is a video of uh, some protests in Spain around the 50M movement, uh, and lights here are, are, are tweeting, tweets uh, that are exchanged between users. I would like just to highlight two aspects of these online social networks. The first one is that the tiny scale of the uh, diffusion dynamics is radically reduced when we are dealing with this kind of communication means. And secondly, that the individuals are now exposed to many sources of information and data uh, which they value differently. So this raises the question of social influence. Uh, you, you have a lot of contacts, but you don't value uh, the input from these contacts the same way. Um, uh, another point to make here is that although we have this online social network that makes communication uh, faster uh, and easier, uh, the online world doesn't make the average individual or the average individual approach better. Actually, uh, online networks are not democratic. We have a few individuals that receive a lot of messages, and just uh, and most of them receive just a few, and, and, and are mainly senders because they send a lot more messages than the number they receive. So this finally um, leads to the question, one of the most interesting questions that we face uh, and, and with practical implications is um, whether this collective behavior can be characterized and in particular uh, how cuts case of information are generating and propagate in the network. Um, if actually, if you measure uh, again the, the side of the cascades that are, are generated in my network are circulating through my system, you find that this is distributed again following a power law. This means that the vast majority of cascades involve just a few individuals, while a few of them go throughout the whole system. Who trigger those cascades? Uh, uh, who they are and how they build up their influence are all questions that we have to address in the near future. Um, just to conclude, I hope to have shown you that the study of human behavior poses new inspiring challenges, uh, and then the question is how to tackle them. I think that we as a physicist know the answer is as simple as going back to the regions. We have to observe the world on the one hand, on the other hand we have to collect data. Today the value of getting data is, is, is more than the cost of having the data, so we, we have to collect data. And also, we have to do a specifically designed experiment wherever needed. In doing this, I think that uh, we will be able to develop new concepts and methods uh, to overcome our current limitations. And um, also, by understanding this kind of phenomena, these large scale systems, we will group the pieces together. Uh, for me, for, as a physicist, I, I will. Give, I would like to give a, a take-home message. Uh, the last message of my talk is that in doing this, during this process, I think that the most important is that we will learn uh, new physics in the, in, the, in the process. So that's, uh, that's all. Thank you very much. It's my collaborators. Thank you.